Yeah, I think it started recording. Okay, so yeah. So I'll conduct the lectures uh, on quantum computing. And before you start, uh, this is not a good time for me to conduct the class. So I'll propose uh, Monday, uh, Monday 5 to 6.30 and uh, Tuesday 5 to 6.30. Is it okay with you? Uh, sorry, sir, it is clashing with my timing. Clashing with what? Wh which class? So I have a class on Monday, 3 to 5, and then 6 uh, 7 to 8.30. Uh, this, this particular class was scheduled at that time. And on Tuesday, I have English classes uh, from 3 to 5, and then 6 to 8 is on my QMMS class. So it is clashing both ways. No, no, but but I'll conduct a lecture during five to six thirty. You are free, right? That time you have classes up to five, and then after six thirty, right? After uh, at six, uh, my class starts. From six to eight, I have classes on Tuesday. Which course? Uh, what is that course? English. Yes, sir, it is QMMS course. QMM is what? Uh, quantum methods and molecular simulations. Who conducts his lectures? Uh, Professor Sabhishachi Mishra, sir. Okay. So, Tuesday you have a problem, right? That's what you're saying? Yes, sir. Okay. So, okay. In that case, uh, mm, So make it uh, on Wednesday. Wednesday are you free? Same time, 5 to 6.30? Or anybody has an issue on Wednesday? Wednesday? Uh, so Wednesday I have EVS class from 5 to 6. <laughs> OK. Uh, but before that, maybe. Uh, from... so Wednesday I have 2 to 6 uh, bio and EVS, 2 hour lecture each. Oh. OK. Mm -hmm. So. OK, Monday afternoon, like. Uh, let's say. Sir, I have English classes on Monday afternoon. Oh, three to five, you said, right? OK. Yeah. So. Okay. How do we decide the time then? So, hey, are you guys free on Tuesday morning? Morning, no. uh, maybe ten to ten to eleven thirty, something like that. Uh, no, sir. I have class from eight to twelve. What? What is that? Ten to twelve. We have a class. No, sir. Eight to twelve. Like two hour lectures back to back. And witness the same witness day morning. Witness Sir, morning? I have classes on Wednesday 10 to 11.30. Sir, I have from 8 to 10. Okay. Uh, witness the afternoon, let's say at around 3. Sir, again, a lab at 3. And bio EVS class of mine. OK, so. Hmm. Oh. Friday morning, same. Friday morning. 
does anybody have any class on Friday morning? So we have class from 11 of GR. So before that, we are free. I have 11. a class from 9 to 10. Uh, OK. Rest for the rest Friday morning is free. I have just have a class from 9 to 10. OK, so. This is a bad situation. <laughs> so what to do? Because I cannot conduct lectures on Saturday, so. And not also. Friday, Thursday. Hmm. Uh, excuse me, sir. Can't you switch yeah? the lectures on Monday evening? Yeah, Monday evening is okay, right? Five to six thirty. I'm I'm worrying about uh, other class. Please just no, sir. Monday, Monday five to six. I have a class, a breath course. What is that course? I mean, all the classes are supposed to be in by. Uh, no. I mean, five, right? So uh, it's environmental sociology, sir, by Professor Archana Patnayak, breath course. Monday five to six. Okay. So Monday, somebody has a problem. Monday, five to six thirty problem. Monday. Yes, sir. I have a course five to six. Monday, five to six. Yes, sir. I I had to have a class five to six. A tutorial. Okay. So we would uh, discuss among ourselves and would let let you know. I think we that would be better. That would be better, right? Yeah. Yeah. So I want to have the classes uh, between Monday to Friday, and my schedule is like okay. Monday I have a class from eight to ten. Tuesday twelve to one. Thursday three to five. And Friday two to four. So Wednesday I'm completely free. And all the evenings are I'm all the evenings I'm free, right? From Monday to Friday. So okay, so what you can do is you can discuss among yourselves and let me know, okay? Uh, but I don't want to have classes on Friday, Saturday. Okay. And Friday evening as well. So I don't want to have classes during the weekend. Okay, so yeah. So you guys uh, decide and let me know. OK. Yeah, so let me write it here so that sir, you can will you also give, uh, excuse me, sir, sir, will you also uh, conduct classes for both the physics and CTS course as uh, Professor Sanjay was doing? No, I am not supposed to conduct classes for physics students, by the way. I am only supposed to conduct lectures for quantum computing part of the CTS course. So I am only teaching the quantum computing part, which is a part of the CTS course. That's what I'm doing. Just yeah. uh, so Professor Sanjay's class will be going on uh, uh, simultaneously with this. Uh, I don't know. You may talk to him. I don't know. OK, sir. Yeah. OK, so. Yeah, let me write down my schedule here, so. So Monday, 8 to 10 a.m. Tuesday, 12 to 1 p.m. Thursday, Thursday, uh, 3 to 5, uh, 3 to 5 p.m. And Friday, 2 to 4 p.m. Yeah, this is I'm occupied and I don't don't want to have classes during the weekend. OK. Yeah, so you can decide among yourself and uh, let me know. So let me point out that this is the time when I am not available. <laughs> yeah, OK. Yeah, so another uh, thing uh, which I want to say is that. Uh, I have a channel YouTube channel where I upload all the lectures. 
So you don't have to download the lectures from a Microsoft team. And the address of my YouTube channel, I'm pasting it uh, in the chat box. So if you want to watch the lectures, okay, some later time you can you can you can watch this in YouTube. So once uh, once the lecture is completed, then I'll upload it in YouTube. So if you want to watch, you can watch that. Yeah. OK, so. Yeah. OK, about the exam. So I'll conduct maybe two exams. And I'll also conduct a Viva. So this is course mechanism. Or uh, yeah. So I'll so I'll conduct lectures and give you assignments. So assignments we have to submit the assignments and there will be exams and so there will be two class tests. So class test. Class test one and two. And there will be um, a Viva. A weightage, I'll decide it later and I'll, I'll let you know. So, but there will be um, a lot of weightage on the Viva part as well as on the class test. Yeah, so uh, this is this is how I'll conduct the exams. Okay, if you have any other question, you can ask me now regarding this course. So this is for PhD scholars as well? Or? This is whosoever I, was, uh, I have registered for this course. Oh. The course is quantum mechanics and quantum computing. Whosoever have registered, I think five students have registered and I'm conducting the lectures for those students. If anybody else is interested, he's welcome to attend the lectures. That's it. Yeah, so any other question? No, OK, so let us begin today. I think we already have spent a lot of time. OK, but you guys please let me know. OK, let me know means uh, uh, you can WhatsApp in your group. So I am also a member in the group, so. So you can let me know. You can fix the time and let me know. OK, so before we start talking about quantum computing, so we need to first talk about computing. And computing means what? You are dealing with some, some data, so you have a problem which you cannot solve, let's say using a pen and paper. Then you want to use a machine. OK, which you call computer, let's say. But it can be any machine like a calculator can also be considered as a machine because it also computes. OK, so it need not be like a computer. OK, but the problem is if you want to compute, suppose you want to play with some data, you want to compute some things, you want to extract some information about the data or anything, OK? Even I mean, in a bigger sense, uh, computing also includes communication. Because when you're computing, you always communicate, you transmit information also from one place to another place. For example, if you're using a desktop computer, then you write it on the screen. OK, uh, first you type uh, whatever you want to type on the keyboard and it get displayed in your screen. OK, so whenever you are typing something on the keyboard, OK, Maybe some ABCD, one, two, three, four, whatever it is. A computer does not know English, right? Because it is a machine. So computer has to process that information and it has to display whatever you were typing on the keyboard. So first of all, so there must be a technology, okay, which will process okay, whatever you were writing. And in general, you will see that there is a cord, there is a wire, okay, there is a wire which connects your CPU or the keyboard, right? So that means uh, the information, whatever we were writing, that is processed, okay? 
that is communicated or transmitted through a wire. Okay. So first of all, so this then whatever this one, two, three, four, whatever you were typing, okay, those get stored because maybe later on, okay, you want to use that result or whatever, you want to store that data, whatever you are doing. For example, let's say you want to download some movie, okay, from some place or you have a hard disk, external hard disk, okay, you want to you want to download that movie from you want to download that movie from the let's say the external hard disk to your computer hard disk okay so a movie a computer doesn't understand what a movie what is a movie right so so computer also has to process this enormous amount of data okay now the question is so there must be some place where this is stored okay but so whenever it is getting stored somewhere in your hard disk that means hard disk has to understand whatever the information is or whatever the content you want to store. But the so so computer so since this hard disk is a physical object, right? A computer is a physical object. Okay. So the technology is like there must be technology which can store the um, the content, whatever not written in a physical, I mean whatever is which is a little bit abstract because the machine does not really understand what is written, what is the content. Okay. But you want to store it, but you want to store it in a physical device. But so physical device has to understand what is the content. Okay. And whenever you are processing the information from one place to another place, it is also a physical process because you are using a physical device to process your information. So the idea here is this is uh, due to Shannon. So Claude Shannon. Just a minute. So Shannon, Shannon wrote a paper on, I and mean, the title of the paper was the mathematics, mathematics of communication, communication. So this paper he wrote, by the way, he is known as the father of information theory or the father of information. Father of information theory. So, so the thing is, the question is, I mean, whatever he proposed is, okay, so if you want to process information and store some, to, some information, okay, some content, it could be a message, okay? So it has to be digitalized, okay? Meaning, he said, okay, it has to be converted into strings of zeros and ones, okay? So this is the first thing, that content, whatever the content is, content, or we can say message in a generic sense, okay? So it has to be converted, converted into, into strings of strings of zero and ones, okay. But zero and ones, they they are also like symbols, okay. Computer doesn't understand what is zero, what is one. But once you convert the, uh, this content into a sequence of strings of zero ones, so then uh, if you can if you can have a device which can realize what a zero is, and if you can and if it can realize what one is, then possibly we can use that physical device to store the sequence, or the strings of zeros and ones. So one way to do it, I mean, so then people develop a lot of technologies, okay, how to how to store zeros and ones, so which can, uh, which a, a, a particular physical device can realize, okay. So for example, if you take a transistor, okay, and if you consider its voltage, then if the transistor has, let's say, low voltage, so let's say transistor. So if it has low voltage, okay, uh, low voltage, then the machine will realize that as a as a zero, okay. And if it has high voltage, the machine can realize can realize it as one, okay. So it is like you can just look at your switchboard in your room or your Right now, you can just watch the switchboard, then there are a lot of switches here. 
some switches are on and some switches are off. So off means let's say it is one or it is zero and on means it is zero or it is one. OK, so once you do that, so basically if you put these transistors all together side by side, then you can actually store the sequence of a strings, a string of zero ones in a physical device. OK, so and these are sometimes called, I mean, now if you want to play with it, meaning suppose you have one, you have two, OK, you have all the integers or you have real number or rational number. I mean, if you are doing numerical computation, then you have to convert the machine has to convert or somebody has to convert these numbers into strings of zero ones okay and then he has to process some calculation okay so so suppose this is corresponding to one first number let's say it is a and there is another sequence okay which is like b so this a and b they are first stored and then there must be some kind of an operation between the zeros and ones which can realize let's say a plus b a minus b whatever we want to do okay so for each of this operation, okay, you must have a realization of a function whose inputs are like strings of zero one. So whenever you are solving a problem, okay, in a digitalized situation, you have problem means it is always a function. So any problem, so this is a problem for a machine. So problem is it is a function. Function from where to where it is from the input space, whatever inputs you are giving okay so this is i can consider this as an input space to output space okay so now when these are numbers or letters whatever it is so then basically in the input space is strings of zero ones right so zero and one so i can say it is zero to the power some n when n is large okay or whatever it is and then the output is the same thing so output is some zero one to the power some let's say d okay so any problem for a machine is nothing but a function from zero to the power n and to the power n means it is just the Cartesian product of the set zero one in times. Similarly, zero to the power d, it means the Cartesian product of the set zero one d times. So any problem can be considered as a function from this input space to output space. And now whenever we have a complex uh, operation like like you want to perform something something like a plus b to the power something or whatever it is okay whatever the function is okay this is your problem let's say then this problem this complex problem let's say can be divided into small problems and the small problems individually can be solved using the strings okay so that means there must be something else here okay which will process that data and perform that perform that operation so what is that operation operation is like addition I mean, I'm just giving some example. It could be anything, but it could be like addition or let's say it is an arithmetic operation like multiplication and so on. So multiplication, OK, so so then the thing is you must have some circuit, meaning some some bunch of wires which will connect this strings of zero ones and it will produce some kind of an output, OK? Yeah, so this is this is the thing. Now the thing now, now the next next problem is you, you must have enormous amount of storage, okay? Because this n could be really, really large. And not only that, suppose you just want to let's say download a movie and movie has let's say size, let's say one GB or let's say five hundred MB, whatever it is. So one byte is eight bits. So these are like these are called bits. Bits meaning the zero and one, these are called bits. So bits are like binary digits. So these are nothing but binary digits. OK, so this IT and this B. OK, so they're called bits. And 8 bit, OK, means one byte. And, and then you have megabyte. You have megabyte, you have gigabyte, whatever, whatever it is. So then you can see, like if you just keep on multiplying that and find it out, one GB means it's a huge number of bits. So at least you need that many transistors in your system to store the data. And now if you consider, if you have a desktop, okay, and it has, let's say, a, a, a hard disk, which has, let's say, size 500 GB, that means it consists, at least a hard disk consists of, let's say, in that case, a huge amount of, transistors okay 
Now you want to do something more, okay? So more means you want to do a lot of calculations. Then there is something called the RAM and other things. So random access memory. So where there is a temp so that memory are kind of there are two kinds of memories we can say, okay? So one you can say temporary and one is permanent. So temporary means in a, in a computer there is a particular memory. Memory means it's kind of a storage system, okay? Where you can store the data whenever you are working on the data, okay? And and there is another storage okay where permanently you want to store for example you log on in your desktop and then you log out and you shut down and again you log on log on and you still find the data there so data has to be stored permanently let's say or, or for a long time let's say okay so there is one memory one storage space where you have to really store a big amount of data and in parallel to that you want to have a nice machine like which is small which is which you can carry everywhere okay so that means you have a, you need to, you need to have a handy machine okay which can perform enormous amount of st uh, processing of enormous amount of data okay so if i call this an integrated circuit so let's say this this i call it a circuit So in this small circuit, okay, you have to have, I mean, if suppose this is one, but you can have many more, so you can have integrated circuits. And then in that, you may call it a cheap kind of thing. And then have, you must have a space where all these transistors, okay, have to be put together. Now, when you are putting this together, so the size of the transistors have to be really, really small. Okay, for example, around in 19, 1930, Seven, whatever the technology, I mean, around 19, I should not say 71, but it is like around 1970. Okay. So one microprocessor, one microprocessor will roughly contain around, uh, let's say, 2300 uh, transistor. Okay. So that was the time uh, around 1970. Okay. But nowadays, it contains millions, billions of transistors because we have to process enormous amount of data. Transistor. Okay. So nowadays, so around, let's say in the modern world, in today's world, let's say, in today's, in today's world, in today's world, it is around billions of transistors. Okay, billion transistors. Okay. So now, what is happening here now? So you have a physical device, okay, and size is growing, okay, and let's say it's now 1971. It has like a microprocessor has 20,000, uh, 2,300, uh, 2,300 transistors, and now we have billion trans transistors. So that means you are reducing its size, and now you can see that uh, ours. I mean, first time when computer was developed or a machine was developed, the computing machine was developed. And today's computer, they're comparatively very, very small. So that means you are not only decreasing the size, you are also increasing the power of the computer. Okay, so two things are going on parallelly. So this process is called uh, this process is called miniaturization. Okay, so you are you are keeping the you are, you are making the size really, really small. Okay, so this process is miniaturization. Okay. And so, so here you had this uh, around 2300 transistor. It can process around, let's say, 1000 uh, floating point operations per second. Okay. Op operation, floating point operation meaning, okay. Okay, but, I mean, there is something called a floating point because when you, whatever, in, for example, in a realistic situation, suppose we have root two, okay, you want to store root two or you want to store pi because in your calculation, these numbers have to be stored. But you know that uh, root two cannot be stored because it has infinitely many digits. You do not have infinite storage. So somehow you have to store this number root two, okay, some number which is close to root two, but not exactly root two. Or maybe you want to store pi, okay, but it has infinitely many digits and it, it cannot be stored. So computer will store an approximate value for pi. So what we're doing here is your computation world Okay, or our computational computational world is finite, but there are infinitely many numbers because we have finite storage. 
our computational world is actually finite. And not only that, our computational world is rational, meaning we can only store rational numbers. We cannot store irrational numbers. OK, so whenever you are doing that, let's say you approximate root two to some rational number. OK, and you are storing that number. OK, this number is called the floating point number. OK, floating point representation of this this original number, let's say. And floating point operation means what you are performing some operation, arithmetic operations, let's say addition, uh, multiplication, whatever it is, OK, with those numbers. OK, so that means what you are doing, it is not an exact arithmetic, but it's a floating point arithmetic. OK, we are, you are only dealing with floating point numbers. And around this time, like 970 or something, maybe 1000 or 10,000 operations per second can be possible. But nowadays, OK, it is like 10 to the power 13 flops. Flops means floating point operations, OK? Yeah, so 10 to the power, let's say 13 or 15. So let me write 13 flops. Floating point operations is possible per second. Per second. So there's a huge amount of miniaturization in terms of both storage and in terms of both performing some floating point operations. Okay. Now there was a guy, and this is really really interesting. There was a guy, so whose name is uh, Gordon Moore. So Moore, okay. You, you you must have heard about Moore's law, and this is not a scientific law. It is just his observation. So. I think Moore was a co-founder of Intel. So he's co-founder of Intel. Okay. Now he came out with a law. He observed this and he said, okay, uh, the the size, okay, of a, let's say single integrated circuit chip, okay, it doubles. The size doubles every around two years. Okay. I think he precisely said uh, one year and six months but it is around two years okay so gradually it is exp uh, it is it is expanding or increasing okay uh, starting from let's say 1950s if you consider okay i think he, he, this most law came into existence in 1965 i mean this is what he his conjecture was okay it's not a scientific law but yeah so according to Moore's law if it grows on this way okay let's say here you had this many transistors okay around 1970 and then uh, 10 to the power three operations, okay? Number of floating point operations. And now it is 2020, so 50 years are gone. And every two years it doubles it, okay? So that means in around 2020 or 2021, okay, there will be almost atomic size, okay, of storage. I mean, this transistor, the, the space for this for a transistor will be really, really, really small, okay? And not only that, when you are decreasing your size, for example, your desktop or your laptop or iPad, whatever you are doing, or in fact, in today's world, if you just, you can have mobiles, okay, like Apple or something, where you have enormous amount of data, okay? So you, so so what you're doing is, you are storing enormous amount of data in a very small, small in a very small device, but device comes with a cost, okay? So if you want to increase the storage, you also have to spend some money. So it's not only about power, this this exploration of let's say storage or or performance or performing some amount of operations. It is also about fabricating or manufacturing those devices, and that is costly. So cost is also increasing. Okay. Then the idea is okay if I am decreasing my size of the transistor, like where I can store zero and one. If I have a if I have anything like a atomic particle, a subatomic particle, okay, which can have, let's say, a possible two states. States means, I mean, which can realize zero and one somehow, okay. Then possibly I'll go to that because of Moore's law, because it will saturate after all, because, I mean, you cannot go less than that, right? It will saturate somewhere because you cannot keep on decreasing the size of the transistor, okay? So it has to go to a level where you can no more, no more decrease its size. So then you can see that nowadays that there are different kinds of technology using like uh, quantum dots or some like uh, some molecular switches maybe, okay, some new technologies are coming in because you need to store enormous, or store and process, let's say, enormous amount of data, okay? By the way, if you are interested in this, I, I took the name of uh, Shannon. So Shannon is the father of information theory and I'm conducting lectures 
on information and coding theory. OK, in this semester and so you can find the lectures, my lectures in YouTube and my channel. OK, if you're interested, you can you can have a look and he uh, so. Yeah, so Sanon actually so so th this is this is another another thing I ju just remind it just reminded me that OK, so for example, I talked about all the numerical letters, OK, but you can have alphabets like A, B, C, D and so on. OK, for example, you are just this reading a PDF, for example, A, B, C, D, but these are these are maybe you are sending messages through WhatsApp, let's say, OK, so A, B, C, D, I mean, these are all letters, OK, these are not even numbers. For each letter also, actually, you can have a sequence of zero ones. And not only that, anything, anything like an audio file, video file, whatever it is, OK, you have to generate a string of zero one. Then how to do it? And Sanon has developed a way first time, OK, how it can be done. I mean, how it can be done in first question is if I want to have a string of zero ones for a letter, let's say A, B, X, Y, Z, whatever it is, what should be the length of the string? Let's say I want to store X. How do I decide what is the string? OK, so he set a limit. So that is uh, data composition like, I mean, this is called source coding, the Sanon source coding theorem. OK, so where he sets a limit that or maybe you cannot go beyond that. I mean, there is for each of these symbols, whatever you want to store using a string of zero ones. OK, the question will be, I mean, how to do that? OK, how to decide about the length? OK, for each uh, length of the string of zero one, OK, for each of these letters or each of the symbols which you want to process or you want to store. OK, and that I mean that that is related to the random variable. OK, because you'll see that if I just put together some of the letters that does not make a word. OK, whenever I say. A word, OK, so some special letters appear, let's say in English language, OK, so all the letters do not come randomly. I cannot randomly put some letters and make a word, right? So that means there, there. I mean, you will see. I mean, the frequency analysis you can do the frequency analysis of all the letters, English letters, which are Bengali letters or Hindi, whatever it is. So you'll see that there are some letters in the dictionary. I mean, in in our alphabets, okay, which are very frequently used. For example, English letter E, S, those are very frequently used compared to let's say X, Y, Z, and so on. So you can always define a probability distribution on each of these letters. OK, and then the question is, how do I use that probability distribution or the random variable? OK, corresponding to that in order to define the length of the code word, code word means our length of the string of zero ones. OK, so th there is a huge theory on that. OK, so this is so this is one thing like like just to just to define the code word, just to define the string of zero one. And next thing will be how to process that. And then he also set a limit which is called the capacity of a channel because you have to pass this information through a channel. OK, and channel is noisy. I mean, there are amount of noise because whenever you send a send a message, let's say what's a message you are using something because there's something in the air, let's say a satellite communication, whatever it is. So this channel is really, really noisy. So your data, whatever you're sending, it may get destroyed or you may get distorted. So there is a way to do it. And so this is classical information theory where people talk about how to define the strings of zero ones to to anything which you want to digitalize okay and how to process that that means how to how to transmit that information okay but anyway i did not say what is an information but okay information is a very generic sense because there is i mean okay it is very hard to answer what is what is information okay but maybe later on in this course we'll try to define that OK, what is information possibly in a scientific sense or in a sense of a digital a digital communication system? OK, so yeah, so that's the story of Sanon. But anyway, so here now we have a situation where everything is very, very small. So maybe we'll go into the quantum world and then this computer will be termed as a quantum computer. I mean, this computer meaning the machine which can compute. OK. So that may be called the quantum compute computer because it has to deal with quantum particles, okay, which possibly okay realize the zeros and ones, okay. And the logic, the logic means how to add, how to separate all these operations, or how to perform something, how to process that information, 
So that logic, classical logic, has to be replaced by quantum logic. By quantum logic, I means which has to obey the law of quantum mechanics. Okay. So I think uh, you 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 have done a little bit of quantum mechanics because yeah, Professor Sanjay Sanjay Majumdar was conducting some lectures on that. And as you say that the quantum version of a bit is actually qubit. Okay, so it is called a qubit. Okay, qubit. Hmm. Qubit. So this is quantum version. So this is just a name. Okay, or you can say this is just a. I would not say unit, but which can realize less than zero and one. So so what is happening here is, I mean, if you can realize, I have a classical switch where there are two possible states. Two possible states, which is like one and zero, either it's on or it's off. Now I am replacing this by a subatomic particle or something, okay, which is physical, okay. I think he must have talked about some spin particle, like spin hub particles, or or polarization of uh, light, okay, a single photon, yeah, or maybe some ground and excited states of atoms. So anything in this world which is physical, okay, and which can realize two possible states, okay, okay, that possibly okay that possibly opens up a way okay to store data because i want to store a string of zero ones so i need a particle i need something which is physical which can realize zero and one okay if that is possible then okay then we'll say and and next thing will be all these operations okay they have to obey the laws of quantum mechanics and then possibly we say that okay we are entering into the world of quantum computer okay or quantum computing so qubit is nothing but quantum version okay we'll define later on i mean how to, what is qubit and so on we'll because we'll we'll work with n qubits so n qubit means you say now if i say a string of zero ones okay I just remember this picture whenever i say i say n qubit so you have let's say switches like this and this is like n number of switches okay so n number of switches and this each of the switch is now it's a, a quantum particle which can realize zero and one so now i'm actually dealing with an n qubit system okay if i call this a system so this is like an n qubit system okay so this quantum version of bit and this is n qubit Okay, I'll talk about this. Uh, I mean, what is qubit, what is n qubit, in much more details. But since today I'm just giving a brief introduction, I mean, why we are turning into the world of quantum computing? In fact, this is due to the miniaturization. Okay, and not only that, I mean, you 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 may be knowing that is quantum operation. Quantum operation means what? From one particular state to another particular state because we are operating with qubits here, okay, from one state of that or maybe n qubit here, then I, it has to be converted into another sequence of zero ones, okay, so maybe another n qubit. So this is kind of an operation. And in quantum mechanics, the operations, this kind of operation, okay, uh, can be uh, can be defined or can be realized by unitary matrix. So all the transformation from one n qubit to another n qubit this 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 operation is like a unitary operation okay and the next thing is okay this is one so so then the thing is whatever operations i'm doing okay since this is a unitary operation i need to develop a mechanism in terms of technology which can realize that unitary operation okay this is a challenge okay this is a challenge this is Realization of realization of of unitary operation. How to do that? Okay. Operation. Okay. Using some kind of logical operation. Okay. This is one challenge. Second challenge is uh, second challenge is there is something called superposition of quantum state. Okay. Because you must must be knowing this that this this particles kind of a thing this quantum particles let's say okay they are not like zero and one so they can realize that's why i am emphasizing on this word realization okay they can realize zero and one 
So I can see a switch is on and off. So that means I'm measuring through my eyes that the switch is on or off, but I cannot see, I cannot, I cannot see a quantum particle. So I must have a device, okay, which can realize or which can measure, okay, some property of that quantum particle, which could realize either zero or one. So that means there are, for example, a spin off or spin down along some particular axis okay of some some spin up particle let's say so so the thing is then you need to have a measurement device okay but after the measurement only we can say whether the state is zero or the state is one but before the measurement the quantum mechanics is okay i'll also i'll also talk about the four postulates of quantum mechanics because yeah because at the for the sake of completeness okay because i'll be using a lot of those postulates okay so so before you measure okay I'll, i mean i'll discuss it in detail later on but just to give an uh, give you a brief idea like how this quantum computing what, what are the challenges in quantum computing okay so i'm discussing this so before you measure whether it is in zero state or in one state but zero and one it is like virtual it is abstract zero means some property okay and one also corresponds to some property of the particle okay which i you might be knowing that there's some something called observable okay so but we'll talk about it later on in detail maybe so zero and one okay so so before i measure i mean uh, before i measure the particle are in a superposition of the state zero and the state one so we, we are using okay i think you know this so we are using this notation which is called dirac notation okay notation k zero and k one they represent okay two orthogonal states okay orthogonal in the sense that one is a complementary of the other one okay but when i say orthogonal it is mathematical that means zero and one okay in quantum mechanics they represent some vectors which are orthogonal in in the sense of inner product okay so inner product is zero so that means the states are modeled using some vectors okay and then they are orthogonal behind the vectors i mean this 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 vector space this vector space there is an inner product so it is basically an inner product space this is math 2 so once you have an inner product space, then I can define inner product for any two vectors, and these vectors are orthogonal. So, so this is direct notation, okay? Kit zero and kit one. So before I measure the state of the particle, okay, can be in the superposition of these two. Let's say it is some alpha zero plus some beta times one, and we also know that mod of alpha square plus mod of beta square is equal to one okay we'll talk about much more detail but i'm just because you know a little bit of this so i'm just uh, discussing this so so before you measure the state it could be let's say it could is phi or psi so this is a state and once i measure okay i'll get a value so either zero or one but you see here zero and one are classical so i'm extracting classical information from a i mean whatever we mean by information let us forget for the time being let's say information in a sense like the value of this either zero or one okay so that i'm um, realizing from or through a quantum particle okay so the superposition the question is so how to superposition so in quantum computing the challenge is how to exploit okay or how to obey this law of superposition okay i mean exploit in a sense can i exploit this idea of superposition in my quantum algorithm okay that's the question so whenever i am operating something i am performing some kind of operation can i use because this is a property of the of the of the particle the property of the state okay can i exploit this thing in order to improve some kind of performance or in or some kind of yeah so performance okay of the algorithm or of the computation whatever i'm doing okay this is one thing and another thing is what is uh, you must be knowing this which is called entanglement okay entanglement so then the question is two particles which is not a phenomena in the classical classical world and this is this is what that's why it is called a quantum correlation okay not a classical correlation it is quantum correlation so two particles two states can be entangled so they can be correlated meaning correlated meaning suppose there are two particles here so let's say two qubit situation i measure something i don't disturb anything here okay but these two, these two somehow connected, somehow correlated, such that if I measure this, this, this 
the state of the second qubit gets changes get, get changed okay so that means uh, the performance my me measurement okay my operation okay on this part the first qubit let's say this is the first one this second one this is a two qubit situation that influences something on the second particle and once then if i measure the second particle it is automatically decided by the first measurement okay so so this is kind of situation where we call entanglement so they are they are highly correlated they are they are they are really correlated in some sense that property of the second particle okay influences the property of first one or property of first one uh, influences the property of the second one okay then the question will be if if i am talking about registers and if i if i have so this is the whenever these are qubits we can call it a quantum register okay this can be called as a, okay we'll talk about this later also but let's say if i replace this uh, bits or transistors by quantum particles okay, or or replace this bits by qubits okay then this is a quantum register it's not a classical register register is nothing but like you are registering something there right so it is something where you are encoding some information okay so that's why it is a register of some qubits so it is quantum a register so so whenever we are dealing with a quantum register your two particles are side by side okay so and if they are entangled then the question is maybe what i'm supposed to do okay without knowing this okay so that can have an influence on my operation whatever operation i want to do on this particular n qubit okay and if these two qubits are entangled okay that will influence my operation okay so there is a chance of error otherwise you can also say can i use or exploit again the word exploit is coming here can i use can i exploit the property of entanglement of quantum particles in my computing okay can i do that and and it is it is proposed that it can be done but we'll discuss that later but this is this is this is an interesting phenomena which we do not have in classical world so whenever we entering into the world of quantum computing our quantum computer we have to deal with these problems either this is a convenience or it is it's not it is a disadvantage okay but anyway so we can exploit either we can exploit or we can see you can study the properties of this this entanglement or this correlation or the superposition and we can see like how we can how my operation okay in a quantum computer get influence okay by by a phenomena of superposition of entanglement okay or i can exploit this to find an algorithm which can let's say do far far better which performance could be far far better than a classical operation okay or a classical computing system so these two are interesting property and this is a so these two are uh, the the challenges i would say okay there's another challenge but but but, go, but before we go into this i i want to just mention this idea of a quantum computer okay this this idea what is this idea of a quantum computer okay this was initiated or i would say proposed quantum computer based on some quantum logic based on so whenever i say quantum logic it means i have a logical system logical means the logical means some if i perform some logical operations like if i add 1 plus 2 it has to be 3 kind of a thing okay or maybe i have a statement because we have never done a course on logic so i'm just telling you but okay we'll see we'll see some logical operations here like like addition okay and so on but yeah so whenever i say quantum logic it means i have to do some logical operations or let's say arithmetic operation okay obeying the laws of quantum mechanics so idea of quantum uh, computers okay it's first uh, it's a proposed or, or, or let's say based on quantum logic okay logic okay is suggested suggested by feynman none other than feynman uh, around i think 1980 okay okay he is he is the guy who first time okay propose can can you simulate this quantum phenomena okay in a, in a computer so that's the idea of quantum computer okay and in at around 19 uh, 
there is there was a guy i mean he, he is still alive so peter shore okay he said okay i mean the question was okay he proposed that he suggested that that is okay that is perfectly fine but what will achieve will we do it just for the sake of doing it or it can achieve something which cannot be achieved or yet has not been achieved by classical computers okay that's the question and in 1994 peter sore he proposed an algorithm a quantum algorithm okay so peter sore proposed an algo okay for prime factorization okay meaning factoring any number into product of primes for prime factorization for prime factorization problem and this problem i'll tell you guys this is really a hard problem for classical computer in fact today what are you are doing the the classical security systems including your your atm pin to your email password okay everything is up to certain extent secure right because we are working on that and this security is coming from this problem meaning let's say i mean let me give you a brief idea okay but this is not the precise idea let me give you a brief idea now see if i send you an email okay you can read the email using your password okay and if you send me an email I can read the email using my password and nobody else can see unless I share that email and this is very very phenomenal why because whenever you are deciding a password this is kind of a code okay for you whenever it's a password it means a bunch of letters or symbols or, or numbers okay and you have then a bunch of numbers i have a bunch of numbers okay and this is your private number okay this is not public people do not know okay about this numbers unless you share of course so i have a number you have a number and the question is if i use my number so let's say i have this kind of a thing so i have a key here okay this is called let's say a private key so this is like a lock okay my email box okay so and i have a private key and this is somebody else who has another lock okay and he or she also has a private key okay and there is something going on here some communication is going on from here this side or that side okay so now the question is how this is happening now whenever i'm saying this is a key this is a bunch of numbers and numbers meaning it is let's say let us assume that it is an integer like an integer how it is coming an integer okay so even if you have some a b c d whatever is the whatever your password is let's say for your email i said corresponding to each letter there is a sequence of zero one and once there is a sequence of zero one you can of course convert it into a positive integer okay so yeah using your binary arithmetic using your binary representation of a number you can of course have an integer so basically uh, i have let's say this person let's say this is alice okay and these are the two celebrities in cryptography or cryptology so alice and bob so alice has an integer and bob also as an integer and this is something which is public in the public domain meaning anybody so when i'm communicating this anybody probably can hack that okay hack or access that okay if he is a say smart enough probably can hack that but still this is secure up to certain extent okay now whenever so there is another thing so okay maybe i'll talk about quantum cryptography later on some in some point of time and then we'll talk about that what is this called public key I and mean, this is something some key which everybody knows okay i mean if you have interest to know so one can know like what what is that okay public key now this this key is available for everybody okay but the private key is only available to this party like alice and bob so there is another so public using the public key and both this private keys bob cannot know what is the private key of alice alice does not know what is the private key of bob but if we let's say multiply this okay i mean let for the sake of doing it let's say this is n and this is m this n times m let's say this is known let's say somehow 
this is known but you do not know what m is bob bob does not know what n is bob does not know what m is but they both know let's say the product of it n times m and let's say assume for the time being that n corresponds to a prime integer uh, a prime number and m, m is also a prime integer okay so that one base essentially the thing is let's say public key something like that which is an integer okay which is product of two integers n and m but unless you know n you do, you don't know what m is but if you know what m is then what you know what n is okay so if you know one of these integers you know the other one but you do not know both of them but you know the product of it so the basically the idea is so this is called rs equivalent system so we will possibly discuss about this in this course r is a crypto system uh, crypto system so which is like this is a protocol which we use for security of our classical machines classical devices okay so here the idea is this is classically hard problem okay what do you mean by hard that we will discuss maybe later on in this course but let's say that i want to factorize okay an integer into a product of primes if i do that if i can do that if i have a machine which can do that then i know what n and m are but classically you'll be surprised to know there is no algorithm i mean no good algorithm no efficient algorithm to factorize a large number okay into a product of two prime numbers and peter showed proposed an algorithm a quantum algorithm which can do that we do not know classically even it is possible i mean there could exist whether there, ex can, there there can exist an algorithm classical algorithm which can do it or not in polynomial time i mean polynomial time means for this time being let us say with their convenience okay let's say within a hour or maybe within within a minute something like that okay we'll talk about this later on what do you mean what do you mean actually mean a polynomial time later on so polynomial time means in terms of input so then the time will be a function of the input size and this function is a polynomial okay but we'll discuss this later so peter so proposed a quantum algorithm which can break the rs crypto system so there is a threat to security okay and not only that so that means basically there is an advantage okay if you use a platform which obeys the rule of uh, the, the, the law of quantum mechanics so if you use a quantum computer there is an advantage that you can solve problems which classically need not be solved okay this is one way to look at it another example is which i'll discuss possibly i mean i don't know whether i'll be dis i'll be able to discuss i hopefully i'll be able to discuss this algorithm peterson's algorithm and another algorithm is like grover search grover search now let's say i have an excel file okay where there is a data store like your roll numbers let's say now in the excel file whenever i write your roll number it will give me the corresponding row okay the rows are labeled let's say it is first second third or so on but i do not know on which particular row your roll number is so if it, if i have and i do not know how it is arranged the roll numbers are arranged okay so i do have no clue so this is an unstructured data so that where is your roll number so whenever i click on find and type your roll number excel will automatically give me that this is the this is your roll number and the question is if this list is very very huge how much time it will take okay so basically the idea this is called a search algorithm uh, this guy is by the way he's indian grover okay his name is love kumar grover so so um, this uh, grover search algorithm it is a search algorithm for unstructured data so suppose i have some marked item okay some item which i want to search okay the question is how can i search it using a quantum algorithm okay classical using classical algorithm you can find but in classical algorithm okay the complexity i'll talk about that complexity also later on okay whatever the complexity is okay let's say it is n n is the input size i mean the number of items let's say so if it is huge then i need at most that that many seconds let's say for the time being okay or that many nanoseconds whatever it is so 
it is a water n, but Grover, using the Grover algorithm, the search can be done using square root of n. So this is known as the problem, okay, of uh, prime factorization. This is an exponential speed using quantum algorithm or using quantum computer. Exponential, because all the known algorithms are exponential in classical world to factorize a prime. This is exponential speed, okay, the achievement of exponential speed. And here at least the speed is, achievement is quadratic, quadratic speed. Okay, quadratic speed. So, these two algorithms actually inspire people. Okay, so if we can develop a computer, quantum computer, okay, then probably this can solve many problems which classically we need not solve. Okay. Another problem with classical computer is, let's say, I mean, okay, we'll, I will not say much more about that, but but let's say, I mean, let me just mention it. That when we work uh, in desktop, we'll see like uh, there is a heat because it gets hot, right? The heat generates it, some some kind of something which dissipates, some energy, some kind of energy, let's say, in terms of physics, okay? So some 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 kind of, so it dissipates some kind of energy. In fact, it, it was proved by a physicist that when you erase information, it exert, okay? It dissipate, it dissipate some amount of energy. And it is also quantified that how much amount of energy it dissipate. Now see, in the quantum world, as you said, everything is unit. So all the operations are reversible and uh, irreversible in a classical world. But in quantum world, the operations are reversible. So that means in a quantum computer, we may also can save some energy, so so it will not dissipate, let's say, some amount of energy. So so this is also an advantage for a quantum world. Okay. And yeah, so people have tried or attempted to people have attempted to develop technologies so we can realize this quantum computer. Okay. And people have used different kinds of platforms like NMR, I'll say. NMR, uh, quantum processor, processor, or maybe cold atoms, or cold as uh, sorry, cold ion traps, cold ion traps. I mean, there are different tech. For example, there are different technologies also for storing classical information. For example, ten years back, we used to use something called floppy, okay, to store information. We also can use CD. Okay, to store information. We also can have uh, like a small hard disk, okay, external hard disk where we can store information. So there are also different kinds of technologies that we use. So it is not like only in quantum, okay. So in classical also we use different kind of technologies to store or process information. So for the quantum world, people have tried using these technologies, okay, to build a quantum computer, okay, or there can be some superconductor, okay. So uh, you can say like using the spin and superconductors, I sorry, not superconductors, semiconductors. Okay, and in a superconducting channel, so those are called, I think, super, because I personally do not know all these things. I just know the names. <laughs> so superconducting uh, tunnel, tunnel junction circuits. Okay, so these are different airports circuits okay which people have uh, tried to explore okay to develop quantum computer so if you ask me when we'll have a quantum computer but I say this is not likely that I'll have a machine like like that the way we use a classical computer but okay we may have some machines which can be called as quantum computer which can perform certain tasks okay which need not be done or need not be performed by a classical computer okay or classical computing systems okay but by the way another okay another challenge i forgot to mention here i think another challenge is what are the challenges one is the superposition entanglement okay how to realize or exploit this and another thing is something called yeah here something called uh see whenever you are 
using a quantum register, for example, here, it's quantum register where you have a register where there are n number of qubits, you have to perform certain kind of operation, okay, logical operation, then you must have also control on the evolution of those states of the qubits, right? And there is a phenomena called decoherence. Decoherence. Okay. This is, I mean, I would say this is one of the biggest obstacle. Okay. To realize or to develop quantum computing. Meaning, uh, what is decoherence? We'll talk about that if we get time. Okay. So, so this is kind of an interaction, okay, which affects the performance interaction between the qubits, okay, which uh, or maybe with the environment, whatever it is, okay. So, so there is there there, are, there is one space which is let's say the qubit space, okay, the space of the qubit, and there is environment or something, okay, which the space this qubit space can interact with or the qubit can interact with, and then we will lose the control on the qubit, okay. And this is a highly challenging thing, okay? This is one of the main obstacles, okay, in developing uh, quantum computing technologies. It, it is it is a very big deal, I must say this, yeah. Okay, so uh, so before we, uh, we discuss all those things, so we'll have to know a little bit about computing, as I said, in, in a little detail, like because we want to, generalize those concepts into into the quantum world okay into into the laws i mean using a mechanism where we can use uh, quantum mechan laws of quantum mechanics okay so we need to know a little bit about the classical computing system i mean then only we can talk about quantum computer system but i'll i'll go i'll do it very very briefly okay so yeah so do you have any question regarding whatever we discussed you can ask me. By the way, you can ask me anytime if you don't understand anything. Because I cannot see your faces, okay? So this is not a physical class, so I don't know. I mean, yeah. Okay, no, okay, no question. So we'll go ahead. So this is a little bit about mm, classical computation. Because we want to improve something, okay, which need not be done by classical computation. So before we know, we need to know. Like what is classical computation? Second thing is we want to develop a quantum computer, let's say, but we first need to know how does a classical computer work, okay? So, so we need to know a little bit about classical computation, and then we try to generalize all this thing. Classical computation or classical computing. So we need to- Sir, one question, sir. Yeah, uh, please go ahead. Will you be discussing this, what hard problems are, what complexity is in our- Yes, course? yes, hopefully, oh. yeah. Hopefully, yes, yeah. So, okay, okay, let me say whenever, okay, okay. So, uh, so whenever I say classical computing, it means the theory of computation, I mean, but I'll discuss only very briefly. I mean, suppose I want to develop a model of, what is a model of computation, okay? So in the classical world, there are primarily two models of computation. One is something called, I mean, uh, this uh, Turing model. Okay, or something called Turing machine. Turing is called Turing machine, and other one is called which is which is close to the reality, meaning whatever we're using. So this is called circuit model. Circuit model. Okay. Uh, this is Turing machine or Turing model, whatever you call. Okay. So these are the main thing, but no, I mean, this, these are the two models using which we classically we, we compute something. But along with that, we also have to look at what are the resources we are using, okay, in terms of, let's say, memory, time, energy, whatever it is. So there is, we have to talk about complexity of computing also. So computational complexity. So when you are computing, we have to focus on that because I don't know whether I can have an algorithm which is efficient or not. How do I judge it? Maybe I can judge it during how much time it can take. There's one way to do it. Or maybe how much memory space it can occupy because it may need an enormous amount of data and I don't have that space to store the data. Okay. Or maybe in terms of energy, how much, I mean, that must be of course correlated with, with time and space. 
okay but i can say how much energy it will exert okay or how much energy i need to use to perform this okay so this is computational complexity i also need to discuss that whenever i am discussing computing complex uh city okay so this is like i would say space or the memory memory or let's say time okay or let's say energy so i also need to discuss that okay so along with this model and it, by the way this uh, turing is actually uh, so this turing this is a name of a person i mean the certain name of a person his name is ellen ellen turing so he is he, is, he was a british british mathematician ellen turing okay and he proposed to this formulation around i think 1930 okay this his idea of a turing machine and this idea is very very simple by the way i mean i mean will i'll not discuss in much more detail because my course is on quantum computing but still uh, he is the first guy actually i would say okay who conceptualized the idea of having a machine which can perform numerical computations okay and the machine means what i mean if i want to compute it, i can consider also myself as a machine because i can compute but what do i do when i compute i have a memory like <laughs> i have to remember something let's say i want to operate something i need to know at least the definition of the operation let's say how do i add how do i multiply and so on okay and i must have a memory okay so this is one thing and so i must have a space okay where i can i can i ha i must have a memory space so if i want to develop a machine i must have a space where or it will store some information right it has it must have a, a memory space second thing is uh i can let's say uh so for example if i if i if i perform some operation i have to go from i have to i have to go from one place to other place for example i am doing something okay so starting from today okay so what i did today maybe it will be used later on maybe tomorrow or maybe after one hour okay so somewhere okay somehow i need to access okay what i did so what is my previous state and what is my next state okay so i i must have i must have a control unit in my machine okay control about which can control the states okay possible states okay of my computation this is one thing okay and the next thing is that there must be something okay uh, which will direct me what to do next so i must have a sense of algorithm but anyway we will talk about it i must have a sense what i do next so in fact the initial notion of an algorithm okay people otherwise used to call it a proof like if you have a theorem you need a proof okay but now proof can be considered as algorithm if it is not let's say a constructive proof it is an algorithmic proof that's that that's that the concept of algorithm itself you can consider as a turing machine okay so the idea of concept of the, the idea of algorithm is equivalent to the idea of a turing machine because algorithm means step by step okay you have finite number of steps okay so you have to use those steps one by one okay similarly turing machine does the same thing one by one how to proceed it so so he actually this is the guy who conceptualized the idea idea of algorithm algorithm like step by step okay so step by doing something trying to reach the final goal step by step okay and he said actually i mean his idea was okay i can have an algorithm for a problem and then i can use that algorithm i can implement that algorithm in my machine and i can solve the problem okay but but this the first time when he say something like this kind of a concept people is of course see i mean what are we talking about okay people of course will ask and the big guy hilbert david none other than david hilbert asks a very fundamental question okay when he, he proposed the idea of algorithm let's say or the machine he, asks, he said okay if you say like this if you if you if we have an algorithm to solve a problem the question is can i have an algorithm which can solve all the problems okay so his question was he proposed this so like i mean he asked this so the, the, his question was david hilbert's question was 
around the end of i think uh, 20 at the beginning of 20th century okay he asks this yeah of course this is 1930 yeah so he asks can we have can we have uh, an algorithm that can solve all the problems in this world and by the way people can go wrong <laughs> he was thinking that it is possible so hilbert can also do something wrong he was assuming that this will, the answer will be positive okay that there must be an algorithm okay so his is i mean i would say he was thinking that uh, this is uh, this will have a positive answer there must be an algorithm which can solve all the problems okay but another mathematician so this is a nice story actually so another mathematician whose name i mean you should know about the names at least of these mathematicians because of whom we, we are living today like all this computation and information so this guy is godel i think his name was scott godel k u r t godel okay he said in fact he proved it around 1930 Okay, or maybe in the beginning of 1931. So, contrary to the belief of, let's say, I would say, Hilbert, Godel said no. He proved a theorem which said, if you have any logical system, any logical system means okay, mathematics we can also consider as a system which is a logical system. Logical means if some statement is true. then you have a negation of the statement which is false and if you have a combination of some statements which are either true and false then you can have a tautology you can have a proposition which is either true or false because when you have a lot of statements and you do some operation this implies that that implies this and so on finally you have a bunch of statements together some of them are false some of them are true and this gives you a proposition okay and this gives you uh, a proposition which is either true or false kind of a thing like that So, so whenever you stick to a logical system, so he's uh, Gödel. What Gödel proved is very simple thing: that in any logical system in this world, okay, there are always propositions which cannot be proved and cannot be disproved. Meaning, you can you can have problems which cannot be solved. So there cannot be any algorithm to solve that problem. So he he is the guy who said there are some problems which are undecidable. you cannot decide whether it is true or whether it is false so he proved i would say he proved that in any mathematical logical system logical system there are propositions there are propositions that which need not be proved which are undecidable let's say which are undecidable so there cannot have any algorithm which can be proved as well as it can be disproved okay okay <laughs> then so basically i would say godel sets the limit of computation <laughs> okay that the you cannot have an algorithm for all the problems okay there are problems which are undecidable we cannot we can't solve this and i mean yeah so can i give an example of a problem which is undecidable which can be proved or disproved i would think of anything like that halting problem what halting problem yeah so okay maybe i will take talk about one to two examples okay so mm, uh, later on okay which are undecidable okay you cannot decide whether it is true or false okay yeah so now i think we have to stop here we, yeah so yeah so maybe uh, we'll talk about this next day okay I'll, yeah any other question I mean, I will go a little first, uh, a little fast, uh, in the beginning uh, when I am talking about classical computation, at least because this is not a part of the syllabus. But 
I believe one one need to know, one needs to know actually. I mean these things because I mean if you are if we are talking about a quantum system, I first need to know what is the system. So if you are talking about computing, in fact quantum computing, I need to know what is computing. I mean what does computing mean? Okay, what is the meaning of computing? And since I have a computing machine, I at least need to know how it was developed. And what what are the rules? Okay, how it is the what what is the logic behind it? How does it work? Okay, and then we can possibly go ahead with like if I replace all these things or what are the challenges? Okay, that uh, the the classical world you know, or classical system it cannot solve. Okay, then possibly I'll look for another system. Okay, which can solve these problems. But yeah, but uh, but I would must say that quantum computing community still do not know what is the power of computing okay, quantum computing to be very very precise there are certain examples of course i said but did we i mean we are not able to let's say implement source algorithm okay so okay source algorithm is a nice thing but but we still could not implement it but it is not also like that we'll never be able to implement it right so, so it's still there but still it is not i would say it is not clear what is the power of quantum computing in a true sense like in a sense of using it okay but there is hope and people believe in hope so yeah so that's why we are doing this course yeah so if you do not have any question okay i'll, I'll stop the recording if